not actually sure what the other community is that's joining us. So just in case, I'm a naturopathic physician. I've actually been working with Shea Holmes and Blue Star for um, about 14 years. Do I say a different number every time? I think I do. Somewhere in the small teens, let's say that. Um, and uh, I do uh, private um, naturopathic care in a couple of the communities. And then the fun part is is giving these talks, which we've been doing about monthly, um, on different wellness topics that otherwise we can't, I wouldn't be able to explain so well to people. So it's a really good um, opportunity for me to reach out and hopefully for you to learn different things. We're gonna talk today about um, bone health or the health of your bones. Um, this is a hard one, right? No pun intended, right out of the gate. But this is a hard topic, a hard place to be if you have to make this decision for yourself. Because frankly, there aren't great options. And you know this if you've been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis. You know you probably went down a rabbit hole of research of trying to figure out what you should do. Um, and frankly, the end of the story is we don't have a great answer for you. So I'm going to walk you through the different options today and tell you kind of how we got here and... and um, what are the best things to do um, preventatively, um, and then hopefully help you with that rock in a hard place that you might in, be in um, if you found yourself with one of these um, diagnoses. So osteoporosis and osteopenia, are obviously, I think you probably know, a decline in bone health that um, naturally occurs as we get older. Um, the, we're going to talk today about the prevalence in the diagnosis, um, the pharmaceutical options, what we can do nutritionally and, and supplementally, um, and then hormone care as well. So most women over the age of 50 um, are considered osteopenic by today's standards, about 54% of women. So more women than not are osteopenic, and there's a reason for that, and it has a lot to do with how we figure the math on these things, so we'll talk about that. Another 30% of postmenopausal women are osteoporotic. Um, by the time we're 80, about 70% of women are osteoporotic. So you can see it's a really um, widespread issue that affects a lot, a lot of, mostly women, can affect men as well. Yeah? Could you give me a quick definition of osteoporosis? Yes. I will definitely, I'm going to give you a really good definition in just a second of osteoporosis. For now, just know that osteopenia is like the onset of bone loss, whereas an osteoporosis is a, a full-on diagnosis of, of overt bone loss. So osteopenia is a little less of a problem, but it means that you're on the road to osteoporosis. But we'll talk about how we make those delineations in just a sec. Uh, by age 80, yeah. osteoporotic. Yes, osteoporosis. So they have osteoporosis. So they're full-fledged, have bone loss that's outside of, of, of the norm. Okay? Um, women are about four times more likely to be diagnosed as men. Women are more likely to also have a natural onset of osteopenia and osteoporosis, meaning that it wasn't medication-induced or some otherwise um, induced by lifestyle or something. Cause for most people, 80% of risk is associated with genetics. Well, that's a bummer, right? Because you can't do a whole lot about your genetics. Um, small framed, especially Caucasian or Asian women, so if you want to know what future osteoporosis looks like, it's right here in front of you. Um, small frame just means that we have less pull on our, on our bones um, as we were moving around in life, and this just let our bones not quite remodel as much as... Um, a person that has more uh, musculoskeletal tissue or even a little bit more weight. Um, poor nutritional status, lack of weight-bearing exercise, um, body mass, and this is a reverse of most of our risk factors. A small body mass here is going to um, increase the likelihood of bone loss. Um, poor hormone status, and then alcohol, smoking, sedentary lifestyle. So those are certainly things that you can do to um, progress the possibility of bone loss, um, but a good percentage of it is just what you inherited from your parents. So the reason we have concern for bone loss um, is because of fractures. So fractures continue to be um, a, one of the top leading causes of death for elderly um, in, in this country. Uh, and most fractures are going to be related, or many fractures are going to be related to um, a bone health decline or a, a osteoporosis. There are about 30,000 hip fractures per year. This is expected to quadruple by 2030, and this is just with the aging population. Um, most hip fractures are from falls. Most falls are in the home. Um, so a lot of these are 
very difficult to prevent. And so what we end up trying to do is trying to obviously make the bones a little bit stronger so that if you do fall, we don't see a fracture. So I often tell people that when we're treating for bone health, we're always treating for the future. So at 50, we may be thinking of doing different nutritional supports, or 30 if you're a candidate for it, um, different nutritional supportives or supplemental supportives. And what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we don't have to put you on a pharmaceutical when you're 65. Then when you're 65, we can become a little bit more aggressive again with what we're doing for your bone health. And at 65, what we're doing is making sure that when you, if you fall, when you're 80 or 85, that you get up from that fall and you don't break a hip. So our treatment strategy is almost always looking ahead and seeing what are we doing to prevent what we think might be coming for you. So fractures too, it's important to remember, they are a cause of mortality. So you don't think of a hip fracture as being something that would lead to death, but it's very common in the elderly because once you stop uh, unable to move as, as well, uh, you're bedridden for a while, you start to lose mobility, um, and it can be just the kind of the beginning of a, of a, a downhill slope for some people. So there are some medications that also affect bone health. So this is where um, other things come in and, and make it a little bit more likely that we might see a decrease in bone health. Um, cortisone or steroids, proton pump inhibitors. So these are the acid blockers, even the ones that you might be buying in bulk at Costco, right? They do come with their side effects. This is a big one. They keep you from absorbing um, calcium, keeping you from absorbing actually a lot of, a lot of nutrients. Um, and one place where we definitely see a detriment is your ability to remodel and build new bone. Anti-epileptics, um, cancer medications, hormone disruptors, um, these all too will decrease your bone health. So how do you diagnose? So here I finally made it to where you want to see the ins and outs of how we diagnose what's going wrong with bone health. Um, we use something called DEXA scanning or, or um, a dual energy x-ray absorbed tomometry. I put an extra word in there, metri at the end, sorry. Um, this DEXA scanning basically, um, it, we look at different places, different um, views of bone health to see what the density is. And the basic of it is that we compare that to a norm. And so it's, if you look back, let me actually I'll switch to the next slide first, and I'll come back. So all of it is based on standard deviation. So if you're a mathematician, this is all based on a bell curve, right? So, or who else uses bell curves? It's not just mathematicians, right? Um, but basically what we're doing is we're comparing bone health and what we see on your DEXA scan, and again, usually in three different places, um, and we're comparing that to a normal 30-year-old. So on the one hand, for age 30 is the place where we have our peak bone health. So that's where we see um, bone building till we're 30. We have the best health of our bones at age 30. And then we have a decline um, from 30 after. So you can see just by the way that we have the math set up to look at bone health, we're all going to have some decline. And it's always important to keep that in mind. We do not expect you to have what's called a T-score of zero unless you're 30 right, you are going to naturally have some decline in bone health, so we're all going to have a T-score that varies from the middle. And what that means is if our perfect 30-year-old was having a DEXA scan, they would be right in the middle, right, or more appropriately, a group of 30-year-olds would be right in the middle. When you start to have a decrease in bone health, they start to measure that compared to other um, people that are over 30, um, and they start to push you out away, what's called a standard deviation, away from that perfect zero. So if you're one standard deviation away, that means you're in the top 68% of, of bone health for women. Um, so you're just one standard deviation away and you're still considered normal. If you're more than that, then you, you, they start to say, well, you know, your bone health is a little bit um, worse than the average person. So your T-score is now negative 1 to negative 2.5. Now we're going to diagnose you with osteopenia. So you're laying just a little bit more on the outside of that bell curve than we want you to be on. If your T-score is greater than 2.5, you're on the edges of that bell curve, right? So now we're seeing that your bone health is a lot uh, worse than average um, by a significant percentage, and we want to be a little bit more careful for your fracture risk. Yeah? When they did the blood density scan next year, my arm was osteoporotic. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, um, we had a DEXA scan and one arm was osteoporotic. Everything else was normal or osteopenic? 
Okay. Okay. So it can mean some things. If you have like a variability, typically what we'll do is if you if you're osteoporotic in one area and osteopenic um, in the other area, so worse bone loss in one area and not as bad in other areas, but we still see you trending in that direction, you'll generally still be treated um, as osteoporotic. If you have one area, who knows, could be a place where you had um, a, a prior injury or something along those lines that, that made that one area um, become a little bit worse than others. We measure the other, all the areas though, trying to catch one. So it's not like we need all three to be osteoporotic. We tend to diagnose the osteoporosis once we have um, one area where we're seeing a significant amount of bone loss. So current guidelines are to get a bone scan at age 65. Now this might seem strange, right? Because I just said that 54% of 50-year-olds are osteo uh, have osteopenia, right? Have some um, sign that they're having bone loss and trending towards a, a more um, a dangerous bone loss. The reason that we tend to start at 65, and there's some variability to this. Some physicians will recommend um, as you approach menopause or getting a baseline a little bit earlier on. Um, 65 um, tends to be the standard of care right now. The reason is because we tend to not start medications until you're 65. And so what research shows us is that uh, regardless of whether we know that you're osteopenic, or osteoporotic, it doesn't change the treatment outcome until you're age 65. And the reason we hold those medications is because they're not great choices. Um, and if any of you have ever had to research or think about taking bone medications, it was probably a hard choice for you because uh, we know they come with some risk factors and side effects. So much so that we say, let's hold these till they're 65 because if we're not making a big difference by treating them at 55, we don't want to put that in the mix yet. Um, 70 for men is typical, a typical screen. Um, typically, if you have no osteopenia at age 65, um, you're turned loose. You probably don't need to have another DEXA scan. If you do have osteopenia or osteoporosis, typically you're monitored every two or three years for your bone health. So it's important to understand the process of bone formation, especially when we start to talk about pharmaceuticals and how some of these things work to try to treat you. So a really simplified view of the physiology that occurs for your bone health is that our bones are constantly in a state of remodeling. Um, and they're both primarily driven by two types of cells called osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoblasts um, are cells that are in charge of building bone. Osteoclasts are actually in charge of reserving or taking away some bone. The reason that we have this system in place is obviously we need osteoblasts to build bones, correct, while we're growing. We need osteoblasts to repair bones if we have any injury, um, which, by the way, we think of injury as breaking a bone, but we're having a constant state of inner. In uh, injury as your muscles pull on bones, and that's what stimulates actually the osteoblasts to work. And that's why we tell you you weight bearing exercise. Your muscles pull on the bones, it causes a little bit of micro damage on the bone. Those osteoblasts will come in and repair it, and lo and behold, you have a new, stronger bit of bone there. We also need osteoclasts though, because what we don't want is between the age of 30 and then when you are having increased bone loss, we don't want your bones to be continually getting larger, right? It might be nice to say, oh, I gained five pounds, but I'm pretty sure it was my, my femur. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a wonderful excuse. That's not how it works. Bones <laughs> tend to stay the same size and we want them to. We don't want to have a bunch of overgrowth um, as we're getting older um, or as we're adults. So we, have, we know this process and we know that basically we have two options for building bones, right? We can either stimulate osteoblasts um, or we can uh, limit osteoclasts. So we can, we can limit that bone resorption so that we're not picking up, up bone quite as, as efficiently and that way we're able to build bone or keep bone stronger. And this is exactly how the bisphosphonates work. So this is the most common medication class, including Thosamax, Actinel, Reclast. Um, these actually inhibit osteoclast formation. So you're basically inhibiting the ability for bone to be um, picked back up. So that way you're able to uh, have more osteoblast activity or increased bone building, and you're not resorbing it at as quite a, a quick of a rate. Usually this is a monthly pill or a, can be an infusion. Um, uh, and uh, 
these are the most loaded questions, right? This has been the standard of care and very commonly prescribed, um, but we do have some side effects that we have to think about, which we're coming up next. The next most common option is HRT or ERT or hormone replacement therapy or estrogen only replacement therapy. Um, we definitely have evidence, have always known that the point at which we have a rapid decline of bone health is the point of menopause. So the point where your own estrogen levels start to drop. So replacing that becomes an option to um, stimulate osteoblast activity and decrease osteoclast activity so that we see an increase in bone health. Of course, HRT and ERT come with their own loaded questions of risk factors and benefits, right? So it's not necessarily an easy answer, but possibly an answer for some people. And then we have what are called selective estrogen receptor modulators. These are um, not new, but a little newer on the scene than the others. Um, and they can, um, in a non-hormonal way, um, stimulate estrogen uh, receptors to, to hopefully help you with a little bit of bone health. So when are these pharmaceuticals prescribed? Generally, again, when you're 65 or over. We just don't put you in that risk category before because we don't see a big enough difference in how we can help your bones by treating you before that. Um, other things that do kind of change that, make it a little bit, um, you know, there's a little bit of variability, age, um, other risk factors for sure, um, and fracture risk. So if you've shown an early fracture risk, um, then you might find yourself um, on these medications a little bit sooner. So medication side effects, and I literally tried to make this not look as terrible as it is because I do think people end up in a rock and a hard place, and it's not my intention to say this should never be an option for, for people because believe it or not, as many side effects as I'm going to go through here, it's still sometimes the better choice to treat for your bone health if we know that you are uh, having a severe decline um, in, in the state of your bones. The things that we see, that we know we see with this group of, of medications that this fascinates, um, erosive esophagitis. I feel like even if you don't understand that word, it sounds bad enough already, right? <laughs> but basically, your esophagus gets, gets very worn down. Um, had a, I've had a patient who's actually um, got so weak it uh, detached and became a medical emergency um, with a, you know great amounts of bleeding. Um, so we do see the er erosive esophagitis this is prevented more often than it used to be because now we know to have patients sit up for an extensive amount of time after they take the pills so that we don't see any um, flashback of the pill coming back up into the esophagus. You can get an acute phase reaction. This is 24 to 72 hours after the pill or injection or IV, whatever the form was, where you get um, pretty significant myalgias or muscle pains, joint pains, um, nausea, just generalized inflammation. Um, you can get severe and lasting musculoskeletal pain from these treatments. Um, and then esophageal cancer, hypocalcemia, ocular inflammation. I wish there wasn't another side, but there is. You can get necrosis of the jaw, um, AFib, which is becoming more and more common as a presentation. Um, and then the one that's the most disconcerting, I think, is you can get impaired bone remodeling, and which is basically a decreased ability to repair the bone. Now, take a minute to let that sink in. What are we trying to prevent? Yeah, <laughs> fractures in the future. And so now we know we have a percentage of people, at least who take this, um, who have impaired bone remodeling and an ability to heal if they do get a fracture. Um, and so this is the most controversial place for the medication actually is, are we taking on all these risks? Do we have enough efficacy attached to them? Do we see them um, work for enough people uh, to make the risks worth it? if we're not really sure over time how well we're doing with their, with their bone support. So prescriptions vary. Um, everybody knows these aren't a great class of medication, and I, I don't mean that as a hit on the pharmaceutical industry. I just mean that it's the best of what we have right now in this, in this class and treating these, uh, these um, presentations. But we generally try to keep it as low minimal time as possible to, med to mediate the risks. So um, generally five years for low risk and maybe up to 10 years for higher risk people. If we really think, gosh, the worst thing going for you is that your bone health is not good and we need to be um, playing defense on it. What's, I think, much easier to do is to start thinking about your bone health a little bit earlier if you can, or certainly um, 
point out to your small frame daughters, um, hey, do this early so that you're not in this rock and a hard place that I am in now. Um, because for women, we want you to begin probably as early as 30. So as soon as we know you're on that downhill slide, which is depressing, right? <laughs> it happens at 30. Um, but as soon as we know that you're starting to see a bone loss that's probably greater than bone um, gain, we want you to start to put the things into place to help you be a little bit more efficient of a bone builder. Usually for men, supplements I don't recommend unless we see bone loss. So then that puts you in the treatment category. We typically won't do it preventatively, um, especially calcium, because we have a little bit of mixed reviews on heart uh, health calcium versus bone health calcium for men. So calcium, we typically put you on about 400 to 600 milligrams a day. Um, if this seems low, then I want you to take note of it seeming low to you and go home and look at what you're currently doing. We used to dose um, women a lot higher, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 milligrams. We noticed a couple of things. One is um, whether or not we had an association with calcification in arteries, which is obviously something we don't want. Um, and the other is we were sometimes getting an aberrant feedback loop with a parathyroid, which is the little tiny gland next to our thyroid um, that helps to, um, to coordinate our own production of calcium. So what we notice is we can still get good bone remodeling at a smaller dose of calcium without taking on those side effects. Calcium also is really hard on your digestive tract. So I don't know if you've ever taken a really high dose. It's kind of hard to find one that is tolerable for a lot of people. So we've noticed we can take you down as long as we take supportive nutrients up. The other thing I want you to look at on your calcium, make sure you're on either a citrate, a malate, um, or an aspartate, and not an oxide. These are right next to each other on the shelf in the pharmacy. So you want to look at the back of the bottle and make sure that you're taking one that's attached to a very absorbable um, cofactor so that we can actually get it into your system. And I have bad news. It's not the chocolate chews. Those are, those are the ones that are not. <laughs> those are the ones that are not absorbable. Um, so vitamin D. Uh, probably our most famous uh, cofactor and one that you do want to pay attention to is your vitamin D. You usually want to be around 2,000 to 5,000 IU per day. This is a test that you can have screened. Um, Medicare, if you're over 65, can be a little bit um, trepidatious about covering it. Um, you can do a cash lab if you want to to get a baseline. If you're under 65, you should be able to get a baseline. Um, so you can look at your levels and see where your levels are on your vitamin D and where you end up and have it prescribed at an appropriate dosage. But two to 5,000 is generally a maintenance dose, and you generally want to be up at that level. Um, um, if you are um, uh, being treated for bone health. Um, calcium D, all these cofactors change with kidney stones. So just wanna, that just popped in my head. I just want to say if you have kidney stones, make sure that you're having these things prescribed at appropriate dosages just to, just to counteract any risk factor that you have there. Yes. Regarding the vitamin D. Yes. Um, if you live in the sun. Yes. So if you are out in the sun here, do you still need to take supplements of 2,000 to 5,000? That's a, yes. Do not That's a great question. So the question was, um, in a sunny climate versus a not sunny climate, um, we used to think that um, if you were getting plenty of sun, that was our best way to get vitamin D, um, and you probably didn't need to supplement any vitamin D. Um, I measure, everybody measures people now right off a golf course, and people can have um, really low vitamin D levels. So there's a genetic component to it as well. And usually if we find one family member, we'll see everybody has a low vitamin D level. Vitamin D is a hormone too. It's important to keep that in mind. So we see a dip in vitamin D sometimes when we see a dip in other hormone levels. So you may have gone your whole life with a normal vitamin D level, and then we see it sort of tank out um, when your sex hormones start to tank out or your thyroid starts to tank out or most common all of those all at once, they all sort of get wiped out. So there are different variabilities. You're right, we used to simplify it into a sun, no sun situation, and now we don't. If you were in Seattle for a winter, would I lay a bet that you're a little more likely to have a low um, vitamin D? Yes, but it doesn't mean that if you're in the sun that you won't necessarily have a low vitamin D, if that makes sense. So a lot of good um, information, and I think um, our future vitamin star, because you know we like to pick a, a we like to pick a miracle vitamin every two years and put it in the media. And right now it's CBD, right? And uh, it was vitamin D. It was for sure before that. I think vitamin K is going to have its um, its time in the limelight, um, and probably with 
good reason. It's vitamin K. What we're seeing is that if we pair vitamin D with vitamin K, we get a better absorptability um, and a better um, bone, uh, better stimulation of bone building or bone health. Um, when I get vitamin K, and, and typically I reserve this for people who are osteoporotic, and so again, they're at the, the final stage of bone health where we want to say, listen, we need to do whatever we can. Um, I do a, a particular type of vitamin K called MK4. You can also probably use MK2. There's some research going on on both of them. These are both types of vitamin K2. Now, vitamin K is famous for um, affecting blood clotting, and so this scares a lot of people. This particular type of vitamin K, MK4 and MK2, which are, again, both subsets of K2, um, they do not um, influence blood clotting. They may affect warfarin or Coumadin or, and Coumadin or Plavix or any of the medications that are, that are blood thinners. So we don't um, cross the two over. But for those of us who have normal blood clotting and who are not on any medications, it's a very good option. I think we see better evidence with MK4 um, in bone building than we have really in anything in recent, maybe with the exception of testosterone, um, uh, in recent history. So I highly recommend uh, that you not only are doing calcium, but you're doing it combined with a vitamin K. One thing I want you to pay attention to, because if you go over the counter, I want you to see what I have written up there is uh, where I think the best research is 45 milligrams of vitamin K. Quite often it's written in micrograms. So if you want to look at your bottle and you go home and you say, well, I have 45 micrograms, this is actually 45,000 micrograms. So this is a very high dose vitamin K. So you want to make sure that if you're going to, if you're going to bother to do it, that you're doing it right and where the research is. Yeah. Ask me again in just a little bit. Ask me again in just a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, CG. Yeah, in the, yes, in CG is the, is the microgram, so, yep, okay. The other thing that you want to do is magnesium. Um, magnesium, typically around 230 to 350 milligrams a day will be enough for bone uh, support. Magnesium, you know, is a great smooth muscle relaxer, so almost always I have people on magnesium for a different reason, and then I'm just glad they're doing it for their bone health. So lots of times you'll find yourself on a higher dosage than this, and that's okay. And that would typically be either for digestive support or um, uh, to decrease uh, blood pressure or something along those lines. But at a lower dose, want to make sure you're on a citrate or glycinate. Um, again, not an oxide. We want to make sure you're able to actually absorb it into your system um, so that you're, you're getting the benefits. And then on my maybe list are all these other bone supportives that get good studies and bad studies, and um, we're not quite sure. We worry a little bit that we get a... Um, kind of a masking of bone health, which is maybe what's happening with the with the bisphosphonates of the pharmaceuticals too, where it looks like on a DEXA scan, they look a little bit stronger, but really we're not seeing um, that they're actually uh, any less vulnerable to fracture. So it's almost like somebody sort of paper mache the outside of the bone, so it looked really pretty. <laughs> when the fall happens, the break still happens anyway. Um, and that's where um, sometimes we get these studies with uh, especially strontium, sometimes boron, sometimes they'll get really good studies, and sometimes we'll go, well, really, did we do that? So we don't want to push really high dosages of those minerals, but if they're in a combination bone support, that's probably okay too. Just don't rely on, on them as being the, the magic um, potion for your bone health. But fish oil, of course, other good reasons to take fish oil, so that's an easy one to throw in as well, and we've seen some good benefit too. So what to eat, because it's always great to do what you can with food. Um, calcium, uh, fortified foods are fine. You know, dairy is the star, it tends to be the, the media star of the show with bone health. I always tell people the dairy council is much stronger than the leafy green council in this country. <laughs> and so that's probably why we get a lot of, of more um, accolades for dairy. We actually absorb calcium better out of our leafy greens. So if you're going to push anything for the state of balance with leafy greens, if you put vinegar right on your leafy greens, that will actually pull calcium out and make it ready for you to really absorb it really easily. So if you're an eat oil and vinegar user on your leafy greens, about the best thing nutritionally that you can do um, for your bones. Uh, magnesium, avocados, almonds, spinach, pumpkin seeds, um, vitamin D and K, cod liver oil, fish, and it's the sun. Get what you can from the sun. 
Uh, I mean, barring exposing yourself in a bad way to the sun, right, and all that good stuff. So weight-bearing exercise, again, the way that our bones are made to work and are made to be stimulated to build themselves is when we cause any kind of damage, um, which is basically the muscles which are attached to the bones. When we use those muscles, and especially if we use them in a, in a more drastic way than we usually do, then we get little micro tears on the bone and your bone's gonna come back and sort of patch it up with new bone. That's how we build new bone. And that's why we say it's so important if you're not gonna do anything else, we want you to do weight bearing exercise. So that's either something, you know, striking the pavement, um, carrying your body weight, um, or weights where you're literally um, doing more than your own body weight um, and causing that little um, micro damage. So hormones, I've gone over this in my head, how to talk about hormones without going too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I will do a hormone talk soon. Um, it's difficult to do because we know it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, what we do know is it's very well established that estrogen slows the resorption of bone loss. Again, we know this is where we have the tipping point for osteo. Um, penia, or if you're osteo, already osteopenic for osteoporosis, is when you don't have your own estrogen anymore, then we see a rapid decline of bone health. So we know there's an integral um, relationship between estrogen and your bone health. Um, many, many people are good candidates for estrogen. I know I've said this before in talks, and, and again, I've, I've talked about hormones before, but we're, we're going to do it again. Um, it, We've had a lot of scares with estrogen, what, who's a good candidate, who's a bad candidate. And really the, the thing to know at this point is if you haven't considered estrogen, especially if you have something like a giant risk factor for osteoporosis, you know your family history, you've already had a DEXA scan, and you know this is happening to you, um, don't write off hormone therapy as being a, a not a possibility, especially when you put it side by side with the bisphosphonates. I think it's crazy that people jump right to bisphosphonates and all the side effects and risk factors that they carry without maybe considering estrogen if you are a good candidate, right? Definitely there are people who aren't good candidates, and, and that's what your doctor do, can do is try to help figure out, hey, is this something I should be doing? Would this actually be a much better option for me than taking on the risk factors of other, other options? What are some of the characteristics of being a good candidate? Good candidates for estrogen um, don't have um, a positive history for breast cancer, especially one that was estrogen sensitive, or a positive family history um, for breast or um, ovarian cancer that was estrogen sensitive. So that's typically what we're weighing out. We used to be concerned about um, cardiovascular health. Very confident now that if we give you the right form of estrogen, um, typically meaning we're bypassing your digestive tract and giving you either transdermal or a patch, um, that we don't take on those cardiovascular risk factors. Um, very confident that for the average woman, we don't increase breast cancer risk unless there's somebody with that positive family history. The, the mystery there is, you know, people who don't know their family history or we didn't know they had a receptor because unfortunately they're the first person to show it. So you always carry a little bit of risk, um, but not nearly the risk of what we have thought in the past, um, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago when basically we said, oh, nobody can do this. That's not where we are now. It's we're really much more open to the consideration. Yeah. So decreases in testosterone are also associated with, um, with bone loss in both men and women. Um, well established in men, this is the first thing that we test for, not, maybe not the first thing, one of the things that we test for um, when we see a bone loss, we say, well, what does their testosterone look like? Guess what? We should be doing that for women too. We're not yet, unfortunately. Testosterone has some great studies with improving bone health for women and actually increasing um, uh, bone building. For many, many, many years in both the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical world, we would tell women, we said, we can sort of stop the snowball, or not stop it, we can try to slow it down that's coming down the hill, you know, leading you to osteoporosis, but we can't push it back up. Now we can push it back up. With things like a high-dose vitamin K, testosterone, we actually will see improvements on DEXA scan, which is something for a long time that we couldn't do very well. Is that a blood test? For testosterone? Okay. Yeah, simple blood test. Yep. Um, likely, it's an effect similar to estrogen in osteoclast and osteoblast activity. Also, testosterone is going to increase bone mass, or muscle mass, right? Again, if we increase muscle mass, you have bigger muscles pulling on those bones. You have more activity with those bones repairing um, any damage that those muscles are, are causing when they're pulling on the bones. 
Okay, so what to do after all that? First of all, if you have risk factors, you want to start nutrients as soon as you can, right? So um, anytime over 30 is what I say. Now we start if you, um, if you know that you fall in a category that's maybe a little bit higher risk. So at least a low dose calcium, um, D, and a magnesium is where I would start. I tend to save the vitamin K because it's pricey. And so we tend to save that until we see that we need to work not only on decreasing the rate of loss, but at that point trying to increase the rate of build. Um, we want you to start with weight bearing activity, right? I could give you a thousand and one reasons to do that if we had to. Um, we want you to do leafy greens several times a week. Um, get screened at 65, consider BHRT if you are a good candidate, and then weigh the benefits and the risks of medication. So that's sort of the order that I work in. Um, yeah, and then I think that it's a good consideration for a lot of people. Um, what you don't see is an official like, oh, here's how to fix this. It's an easy answer, and it's an unfortunate place. Um, sort of rivals cholesterol in the darned if you do, darned if you don't category. Right? Um, but definitely, it's a it's an individualized um, situation. But do consider those options that you have um, prior to um, going full on board with medication. And then, if you do need to do medication, um, uh, work with somebody to to kind of mitigate any any side effects that might occur. I think that's it. What kind of other questions do I have? Do you have? I'm going to do off the camera. Okay. No worries. Yeah. If you do take a medication, you know, you talk about the esophagy. I've had to take, I've taken the reclass twice. Can that really reverse it? I mean, I Okay, say that again. Can it reverse the osteo? I didn't tell her. Yeah. The reclass? Yeah. Or? Um, the, it, it, I believe the, the medications are still in the category of just slowing bone loss, and so what they're trying to do is to keep you from um, progressing as quickly into bone loss, and so it should, although you may not see an improvement in your DEXA scan, did you see an improvement in your DEXA scan? I haven't had one. Oh, so you can, I believe you can see minor improvements, but it's considered a victory just to slow the bone loss, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. So there, there's no such thing as over the counter estrogen. Like, uh, this is a lot of progress. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, so the so the question is, over the counter estrogen is that something that we can use to um, improve bone health? My my answer would be no, probably not. But generally, what those are, um, there's no over the counter actual estrogen. Um, when they when something says that it's going to boost your estrogen levels, it's usually going to be like herbs like black cohosh or something in that family. Um, they're very light plant-based estrogens, um, they're enough for some women to stop like vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and things like that. They're not, I think, enough to uh, stimulate any kind of bone health whatsoever. Yeah, so I would not rely on those. Yeah. These bio... Uh, yeah, uh, those are the medications. Well, those are pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I've heard that once you start those, you have to take them basically for the rest of your Usually it's the opposite. Usually that they will do it for a short amount of time and then and then stop them and, and let you um, go on and then they repeat them for a short amount of time later. But usually they're not done forever. Yeah. What else? Any questions from afar? Lake Norman, oh, we found out where they found, yay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I would, I would answer that question with kind of a caveat. So the question was, um, do vitamins have, and these vitamins in particular, maybe have any effect on kidney health? Um, we would not, we should not see any degradation of kidney health with any of these supplements, with most supplements really. 
if you already have a declined kidney function, then we're very careful about what we put in, and we tend to lighten the load across the board on pharmaceuticals and um, supplements. And most of it is just because we don't know, and we don't want to um, test the waters with somebody who doesn't have great kidney function. So we wouldn't expect them to progress any kidney, kidney disease, but at the same time, we would be very careful with kidney disease if that makes sense. Now, I did mention earlier, you want to be careful if you're somebody who produces kidney stones um, and you end up with sort of trying to figure out, well, how do I balance this intake of calcium and vitamin D if I'm a kidney stone producer? Um, and quite often, we have to come back to, to much smaller dosages of both calcium and vitamin D, if any, um, if you tend to shuttle those things over to kidney stones and some of the places where, the, where we want them. So, okay? Okay, good. Yes. Uh, no. No. Yeah. Just to make sure you're getting the right one. So the question, I'm sorry, was um, can you get that prescription, that dosage of a K2 over the counter? And yes, you can. Yeah. Same with vitamin D. You know, prescription vitamin D um, tends to not be the best type of vitamin D. So an over the counter vitamin D is usually better than a prescription vitamin D. You just want to make sure you're getting the right dosage. Any other questions at all? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.